Hello, my name is Reeves, and today we're going to be talking about APA formatting for undergraduate sciences majors. So this is specific to students who need to learn how to do in-text citations and references sections and use proper APA formatting, and they're in a heavy sciences educational program. So I mean heavy sciences in terms of like anatomy and physiology, biology, chemistry, microbiology, as opposed to what we would maybe call the softer sciences, um, certain types of psychology, sociology, uh, th that distinguished we could go on, that distinguishing between those fields is something we could go all day on, but I'm not going to. This is for heavy sciences. I'm at Northwestern Connecticut Community College at the moment. I've taught at other institutions before. That's where I'm at now. So let's go ahead and get into it. Now I'm getting a little bit meta here. If you were to need to write a paper with an abstract, for example, that abstract would go first and you would center the name abstract just like I've done so here. Uh, now, as you can see from the slide right here at an undergraduate level, you probably would not actually need to write an abstract unless your professor specifically requests it. An abstract would would be more like you're writing an official review article. You are actually involved in undergraduate publications or undergraduate research, in which case, good job. You're getting the head of life. Very proud of you. I'm also doing some modeling where I've given you some proper in-text citations. So I can't really do a proper APA instruction without actually properly using APA. So that's something that you're going to see throughout this PowerPoint. So let's go ahead and get into the introduction. It's going to go over kind of an overview of how to use APA. A lot of what I'm going to say here is going to apply to a lot of other styles as well, and we'll talk about that. Um, it's really very closely related to my very strong opinions on the topic, your professor might have some slightly different priorities. So I'm putting this online in general. I'm not just putting this online for my students. I'm going to make this searchable for people at other institutions, and maybe somebody else wants to use this. I want to make it applicable to everybody who needs this information, and hopefully somebody will get some use out of it. Uh, but different professors have different priorities for APA. I'm very confident in where my priorities lie for APA and any type of in-text citation and references section. Um, but, you know, your mileage might may vary. You may want to check in with your professor about where their priorities lie. I'm not really supposed to be teaching APA. I'm an anatomist. I teach anatomy and physiology, sometimes pathophysiology. I'm a heavy scientist. But what I have found is that when I'm assigning something that requires formatting in some kind of APA, MLA, CSE, students don't know how to do it, and then they lose a big chunk of points. And my policy on that, if I didn't teach you something, but then you lose points for it, then the problem is on my side. So I'm going to do this once. One time, I'm going to do a proper APA lecture. I'm going to record it, and I'm never going to record this again. If you're looking at this from the year of uh, 2042, and I look completely different, my hair's all gray, I'm all wrinkly, then you know that I've kept to my promise. <laughs> I really look forward to that day when students start to say, you don't look like that anymore, Reeves. And I'll say, yes, because I lectured it once and then never again. Okay, so why cite? Why do we have all of these styles? The number one reason, according to me and all of the librarians that I've discussed with this, is plagiarism. We have in-text citations and a references section in order to tell us where did this information come from. It's about academic rigor, right? So what we're saying is you got this information from somewhere. Is that resource legitimate? Is it at the level that you are supposed to be at, and at an undergraduate level in this case? And uh, did you understand what you read? Did you understand what you read? Did you put that into your paper properly? Those are all incredibly important things in academia. So if you were to put information in your paper and not cite it, that's plagiarism. Technically, once you've plagiarized, that should be a zero for the whole paper. And so the overview, the general, like the first and most important thing that I want to tell you about this is that if there's a piece of information in your paper, it should be cited. I should be able to see that piece of information, see a citation, go to the references section, find the paper from the references section, and go and read it for myself. Verify that you knew what you said you knew, that you were citing it correctly, that you got that information from a legitimate source.
that is why we do APA. I know it's a lot of like really nitty gritty details, a period versus a comma versus a colon versus a semicolon. When do you put it in italics? When do you put it in bold? When do you put quotation marks around it? It all seems irrelevant, but the very, very core, in my opinion, of APA is just not plagiarizing, giving credit where credit's due. And that's why it's important. There are ad other aspects of these systems. So for example, language and tone. So for example, APA 7, 7th edition came out about two years ago, 2020-ish. And person first language, uh, they actually categorize this as bias free language is new. And that is a style guide that is if you're going to publish in a magazine, or in a, in a uh, research sort of journal, an academic journal that utilizes APA, you're going to have to use APA, you're going to have to use person first language and bias free language in order to be respectful to the communities that you are representing. Now, if you're in sort of the larger community of trying to be respectful to people of various subgroups, you know that person first language is already actually a little bit outdated as of 2022. A lot of people very strongly identify by their communities. So for example, I am neuroatypical. So you could say that I'm a person who is neuroatypical and that's how I'd identify and that's actually fine. But you can also say that I'm a neuroatypical person and that's not person first language but I start very strongly identify as a narrow atypical person. So to me, that's actually okay. But in terms of how you would write about me in an academic paper, you would say person who is neuro atypical, uh, depending on how I identify, you might say person with autism uh, rather than autistic person. And there are some cases where this does create more respectful language. So for example, instead of talking about the poor, you would say people living in poverty, and that's a lot better, right? I think objectively that one is much better. We like that. Now, I'm writing this about APA because it's the format that I've used the most in my undergraduate career, graduate career. My College of Nursing, where I taught, used exclusively APA. My department now at Northwestern uses CSE. I could just as easily be writing this about CSE. I've had a couple of courses that have required that I do it in an MLA. And the takeaway is the exact same every single time. You look it up in a style guide. Academic people, we don't go walking around knowing exactly how to cite everything in MLA or cite everything in APA. In fact, if you're at the graduate level and you're starting to publish, publish things, um, you might submit a paper to one journal that requires APA and a different journal that requires MLA, and you're going to have to go through your entire paper and simply change the formatting on it. So you're not going to walk around knowing the nitty gritty of all of those things. You're going to look it up in a style guide. You might know some of the basics, like, okay, I know I need the author's name. I need to know, I know the journal's like publication date, probably the page numbers, um, you know, the URL if it's a website. I know I'm going to need these things. But the way that I format it, I'm going to have to look that up before I send that to the publisher, because those are the rules. That's it. And I think it's very easy as an undergraduate student to overthink this, because it kind of feels when you first approach it, like typing in another language, you know, you're, you're suddenly bound to these very esoteric rules. And esoteric is a perfect word, because it literally means difficult to understand. It's at this unattainable, unreachable level of knowledge, right? That's what esoteric is. So I think that's a perfect case usage. So it seems like a foreign language. And that's the answer. You, you, you could stop here in the lecture if you really wanted to, and just say, oh, I just have to look up how to do it. And so I've given you a lot of resources for that. And the number one resource that I've ever seen for um, doing APA is uh, Purdue OWL. So this is from Purdue University. They published this website. And here is, this is the type of citation that actually belongs at the end. I really wanted to put it here so that I could get to this whole website at one click if I needed to. And this is also a poster that I'm going to reference quite a lot. So this is like 
the Cliff's Notes version. This is, you click on this and you should be able to command click or control click depending on which operating your system is. And you should be able to get to this from this PowerPoint. And this has your quick and dirty guide to APA. So when I say look it up, you look it up here. This is where you go to look it up. So let's go ahead and head on over to the Purdue Online Writing Lab from the College of Liberal Arts at Purdue University. And what you have here at this particular page, we're at the APA style introduction here. You can click into that poster from right here. You can get into the nitty gritty formatting and style guide here. Now what you see is this drop down menu has expanded and you can say, okay, the basics of in-text citations, what you do with an author versus authors, uh, a couple of different variations, your references list, what the rules are, if you need to use footnotes and appendices, I don't think in any of my projects, you'll, you'll have to do that. Numbers and statistics, some additional resources, headers. Here's a sample. Here's one thing that I'm going to refer to a couple of times is changes in the seventh edition. Technically, I already have. When I talked about person first language, you would find that under this header. Another thing that's right at the top is set your sources automatically in APA. And I am pretty lazy, so I 100% utilized this tool in the creation of this PowerPoint right here. So that's your nice uh, free guide. This one, you do have to have your ad blocker turned off. I had to go through, I have a script blocker and an ad blocker um, running, so I had to fiddle with quite a few settings to get that working for me. Uh, but it should be free to utilize it, and it'll even assemble a references section for you. I say that with a caveat, and that caveat is that some of these built-in tools, there's one in Microsoft Word as well that I'd really like for you to be aware of. You can full-on build your in-text citations and your bibliography inside of Microsoft Word. There might be formatting errors in Word, so you do still need to look up that style guide after you've automatically compiled your in-text citations and your references section in Word, and double check that your italicies, your periods, your commas, and things like that are correct. And this can't double check your formality, your tone, um, your organization. It's just doing the actual physical in-text citations and bibliography. So personally, I have nothing against students using these at any level. I'm, I've am i used them throughout my academic career and in graduate programs. Nobody's called me out for it um, yet, hat, knock on wood. But that having been said, there can be errors. You should be aware of that. And this is not a guarantee that you're going to get a perfect grade on your APA. So the next aspect of APA citing that is of the personal greatest significance to me and people who teach heavy sciences classes is quality of references. I learned really on in my teaching career that the first thing I do when I get a paper is I should scroll down and take a look at their references section and look for the quality of their references. And I've also learned that in order to enforce these rules, I have to write these into my assignments, what the level of quality of references need to be. How many websites can you use like Healthline and CDC versus academic journals? And in general, the higher the level of the class, a 100 versus a 200 level sciences class, the stricter I am on using exclusively academic journal articles as your references. Now, how do you know if you're citing from an academic journal versus a good looking website? So is it published in an academic journal? How do you know? There are a couple of really simple rules of thumb that I like to teach people to help them just double check real quick if that's a good source. And that's what I'm looking for when I scroll down to the end. So here's an example of what that references section, this is something you would see in the references section. It wouldn't have this bullet point. Let's get rid of that. That's a formatting problem on my end. So no bullet points on end of, uh, so references sections, they don't have bullet points. So this has two authors. It has two authors. It has a clear date. It has a clear title. And it's published in an academic journal that is named. So you can find the author. So you can find the date. You can find the name of the publication. 
And that is an immediate hint that yes, that is an academic journal. It ends up being in the website Science Direct, which publishes a lot of journal articles. That's legitimate source. Good job, A+. And let's take a look at that and what that actually looks like in the real world. So I did plan this out a little bit and not that one, but this one, here we go, uh, here. So here's something that is an academic journal. We have the names here. We even know the department, they're at Columbia University. We have the address of that, Neuron Volume 39. We have page numbers. This was published in 2003, which actually is a point that I didn't spend too much time on when I put together this presentation. We've probably learned some more things about Parkinson's disease since 2003. So for some professors, when they're looking at quality of references, they're going to look for things that are up to date. And at that point, if you would like, maybe you want to go to a website such as up to date and uh, there we go, uptodate.com. This will help you search for journal articles about whichever topic you would like, and they're going to allow you to specify the year for the, the years. So you would say nothing older than 2016, nothing old, yeah, older than 2015. Um, and again, this might be something that your professor has specified. They might say, don't use anything older than five years for this topic. But on some topics, we learned about it a long time ago. So let's say you're doing diabetic ketoacidosis or, or even just something really simple like um, hyperkalemia, too much potassium. We figured that out a long time ago. There haven't been a ton of advances. So if your citation is from 1974 on something we figured out a long time ago, that's actually going to have to be okay. Uh, that's again something to negotiate with your professor and just reach out about. So quality of references, yes it does matter how up to date you are, but I personally am aware that it's going to work differently for different topics. So for our purposes, this is an example of a high quality reference. So let's look at a really common situation that I see where people said, you said academic journal, it says Harvard on it, that's a school that's academic. So this is good, right? And now let's take a really close look at this citation. There's no author. There is a date. It's probably the date it was last up updated. This is very recent. Upstein bar virus may be the leading cause of multiple sclerosis from the TH Chan School of Public Health News. And it was retrieved on this date. And let's go ahead and check out that link. It should be right about here. This looks a lot like a journal article. It's got Harvard in it, right? It's even kind of formatted nicely. We've got all of these different links to the side, but this is a press release. This is meant for the general population. This is not an academic journal. And the number one key to that is there's no author here at the top. There is a date because it's a news article. It was released on a date. If you're to scroll down, there's even four more information. Look for this person. That doesn't mean this is the author. So it has a lot of the qualifications of an academic journal but it's not. So how do you differentiate? How can you be sure, absolutely sure, that you're utilizing an academic journal of like a scholarly article, something that represents research that somebody has done and not a press release? Well, this one, this is Harvard, so they do a decent job. They actually do cite their sources somewhere in here. Um, I believe there's some ways to find out where this study, this was published online. So we can go to this article that they're talking about. And now here we are, we found the academic journal article. This you can cite. This is going to be a beautiful, look at all those author names. Oof, gorgeous. And you've got a date, you've got a volume, an issue, page numbers. You got everything you need in order to say, look, I read this study. And you actually then do need to read this study. Don't go by what the press release said. The press release was for the general population. You're a scientist now. So you're, as a, you as a scientist, you need to read this original article. So what if it's behind a paywall? You have institutional access to very many uh, academic journals. So actually, let me pause for a second and show you what that looks like. 
So at Northwestern Connecticut Community College, we have a couple of very specific websites for accessing databases that have academic, give students uh, access to academic journals. So I've uh, in my projects, I tend to link directly to the library's database page and the library's search engine. This is through the library. So this is what some general newspaper art, so it's, they've got it categorized, but there's also this search engine. I did manage to track down the search engine. I went back to the library's sort of main page and I clicked on find books, articles, and more to take me to the search engine that it will only search within their databases, their academically rigorous research paper based search engine. And so I always tell students, you can also do this as a comparison to scholar.google.com. So if you go to Google Scholar and type in Parkinson's, you're going to get nothing but scholarly articles on Parkinson's. I would say all of these are going to be ex excellent, academically re uh, rigorous, references for Parkinson's disease. If you compare that to Google in general, Parkinson's, you're going to get re references that are for the general population. So if somebody is being diagnosed with Parkinson's or thinks they might have Parkinson's, they're going to find parkinson.org, um, places in different locations. Um, you might get some academic articles. Sometimes NIH is legitimate. Sometimes it's not. No, this is the wrong NIH. Um, National Institute on... Yeah, so again, you would think U.S. Department of Health and Human Services would be a legitimate reference, but for the types of papers that you're writing in the heavy sciences, unless it's specifically about like what information is accessible to the general population, no, this is not an academic journal. This is not scientifically rigorous. If you're trying to talk about the anatomy or the physiology of Parkinson's, if you're trying to write a research paper on Parkinson's, this is not a valid reference for an undergraduate college level paper. This is the same information that your uncle gets and you are a scientist and you have the capacity to understand the research about Parkinson's, the science on Parkinson's, not the colloquial level language on Parkinson's. So you're at a different level and that's what needs to be in the papers that you are reading in order to report in your paper. Okay, so that's why just because it's from Harvard, just because it's from the CDC or Healthline or whatever else, just because the name looks good doesn't mean it's a journal article. And of course, we've got to talk about Wikipedia. <laughs> Lots of people ask about Wikipedia. Wikipedia, I'm not going to lie, it's pretty good these days, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at the Wikipedia page for multiple sclerosis. They did a great job. Now, oof, look at all that information on multiple sclerosis. A lot of this is probably pretty legitimate. But no, you're not going to cite Wikipedia in your paper. What you're going to do is you're going to see what this Wikipedia page cites. Here's their references section. They've done a fantastic job. You have to on Wikipedia now do a good job of tracking down all of the resources and all the citations that were used to assemble this information, but anybody can edit it right? So you have to validate the things that you find. So let's say I want to look at the NINDS multiple sclerosis information page and see if that's any good. I haven't clicked on this before. This is spur of the moment. So we'll see what we see. If it even goes through, looks like it's kind of not. Oh, there we go. Oh, this is on the Wayback Machine. So this isn't even a current website. This is a very general information page that maybe your uncle would find if he's concerned that he has MS. Uh, it's not scientific. There are no citations within this article. So no, this would not be a good reference for your research paper. I would say that this is not meeting the requirements for, uh, for quality of references. So let's see if we can track down here we go, Journal of the Belgian Society for Radiology, Diagnosis of Multiple Sclerosis in 2017, relatively recent, within the last five years. There we go, we've got an author, we've got a publication, uh, we've got, where's our year? 
Can we find a year? 2017. There it is. Cool. And there you go. We've got, and they've got their own re references, which is another rule of thumb. Does it have references? <laughs> Does your reference cite other references? So we did find a good reference through Wikipedia, but we have to read this. We're not just going to read Wikipedia. It's a starting spot. It's a starting place. And in my opinion, it's a legitimate starting place. Other professors may have different views on that, but honestly, it, how are they going to know how you tracked this down? So I say, go for it. All right, so how to build a references section. Here's the two you'll probably use the most. Uh, a lot of my students like to use their textbook. It's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, but I usually say, you know, you can use your textbook and then the rest have to be journal articles is kind of where I usually put my level. And this is a little bit simplified. If you actually look at mine, for example, for the URL, it actually does typically say, in addition to the date, you would have like retrieval date and retrieved on blank date from this URL. Uh, but this is exactly specifically word for word taken from the APA style guide overview, which is that poster that I showed you at the beginning. So again, if you do it exactly this way, and then somebody takes points off, you can say, here's my source. And that's another thing that citing your sources is from, is proving yourself right. If you've proven yourself right with the official resources, which are right here, then people can't take points off because you proved yourself right. So defend yourself with APA citations. Here's some just practical examples of how you're going to do in-text citations with one author, with two authors, with three authors. This is another APA 7 change. Once there's three or more authors, you just get to write at all. This is a little bit of a simplification from APA 6. It's quality of life. It makes your life a little bit easier. Um, there are a couple of organizations. You can say Gutierrez et al. discovered something about citations 2019. So it doesn't always have to be in the format of Gutierrez et al. 2019. It can be split up. You can talk about the name in the body of the text and then just put the year at the end. And I just used the most complex version with the et al. You could do the same and say Okoye discovered something about citations 2020, right? You can do that with any number of authors as well. And again, there's a lot of other variations. You're just going to have to look them up, right? It's I don't know how to cite it when there's more than one reference in this one section, right? That's a special case. There is a style guide for how to do that. My recommendation is don't. If you're at this level where you're watching me right now because you don't have a clue how to use APA, don't. Have one sentence for one source and another sentence for another source. It's linguistically easier. Writing style is easier. It's probably going to be more clear. And you are just going to avoid the pitfall of the special case scenario. So think to yourself what your strengths are. You do have to write a lot in the sciences, but honestly, not all scientists are excellent writers. So when you're not an excellent writer, you can just be a clear writer. And that is very preferable to me. I would rather see clear writing. So I'd rather you say, well, I have these two different ideas. One sentence, one idea, another sentence, another idea, citation, citation. Just do it that way. It's clear. Okay, how frequently do you cite? And this is another thing where my students lose so many points. So, did the information in an independent statement, you wrote a sentence, it's not dependent on the prior sentence. The sentence following it is not dependent on it. You wrote an independent statement. Did it come from your mind? No? Cite it. Full stop. If it's an opinion of yours, first, this is a formal paper. It's not really about your opinions. If you're just looking into you know, what is Parkinson's or what is multiple sclerosis? Uh, there's not a lot of room there for you to go saying, well, I think it's actually heavy metal toxicity. Well, did you come up with the idea of heavy metal toxicity? Actually, you didn't. Go find the person who came up with the idea of heavy metal toxicity and cite them, right? 
Or maybe you think it's radio waves. Do you have a citation for that? No? Then that would be your opinion, but does that belong in an academic paper? There just aren't going to be that many scenarios in a heavy sciences writing paper where you're going to be stating your opinion. Maybe there's occasional cases where you have two papers that are sort of competing against each other and you've cited both of them and you want to choose sides. In that case, you would still want to keep the tone very formal. You're still not using first person language. You're still not saying one paper says it's Epstein-Barr, the other says it's heavy metal toxicity. I think it's heavy metal toxicity. You're not doing that. You're still going to say it is the opinion of the author that there is more evidence behind heavy metal toxicity, right? You're still keeping it very formal, impersonal, professional. Now, a lot of people get on my case for saying you do have to cite pretty much every sentence, every independent statement needs a citation. And they think it's so, it's filling up so much space in my paper that it's ugly. That can't be correct. It is. If in doubt, err on the side of ugly, right? Your paper can be ugly with citations if they're at the right site, at the, if they're at the right frequency. And that's okay. It's okay for it to be ugly if you're not plagiarizing. So one thing I see a lot is like a whole paragraph of information. And then at the very end, there's your one citation. And that's a problem because there are a lot of independent statements in that paragraph. Did they all come from this one citation? There's two possibilities. Maybe it all did come from your one citation. You're getting that much scientific information from one source and not validating it anywhere else. Okay, then the number of references you have is probably too low for a heavy sciences paper. Yeah, or it's not all from this one source, in which case you plagiarized. So you see, I'd much rather see a paragraph absolutely full of in-text citations where you're validating every single thing you say, because if you don't validate something you said, you're either plagiarizing or you're making things up. Now, this might be a little bit unique to students in doing my projects. Um, I wanted to include some information on citing information when it's presented inside of a table. And so here is the reference where I found this information and I recommend going to that link and looking through it with a caveat. I've got a caveat. And actually I was thinking about this as I'm putting together this presentation and lecturing on this topic that is of great significance to my students because of how many points they could potentially lose. I recognized that I can't spell, first of all. Let's, let's, let's pronounce ecstatic again. Okay, I've recognized that I have lost a lot of trust in my students in terms of being able to format their papers and organize their papers accurately. So a lot of my projects have moved over to this format where I, ex where I just give you a table and you fill in that table. <laughs> so, Again, if I trusted you with the APA formatting, the information on how to format your paper is all there in APA, how to do these headers, um, how to do these sort of page breaks and organize a paper in APA format. It would look like this just without the table, basically. Uh, but I've lost a lot of faith in people including every category that I want them to include. And I've given them an order that lends itself to good flow. And I don't trust students to be able to develop their own flow. So I've given them these tables and then I have students asking me, how do I cite inside of this table. Now for the purposes of this project that is right, you're literally writing into a table so that you don't fall into the very many pitfalls of APA formatting, um, you just do in-text citations like normal. But if you are writing a table in an ordinary paper, then you would do in-text citations like this with a note below that says where it's from. So that was my caveat, and I think it's a really important insight into, you know, steps that a professor like me has taken to avoid dropping a lot of points off of students. It's, students have pulled everything, right? One thing that I see is, especially in a project like this, is they might just forget to write the outcome section, or they might just forget to write about diagnostic tests, um, or they might think 
they might not be very organized and they might do diagnostic tests before they do presentation or something like that. Um, so this is, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I really hadn't thought about what it means that I've started formatting my projects that way. So in the future, now that I've got this APA guide right here, maybe that's going to go away and you're going to actually have to be responsible for your own organization again after this. We'll see. Let's talk about formality a little bit. This is another thing where students end up losing just a lot of points. In general, in terms of formality, in an APA formatted paper, we're going to use third person language and we're going to use past tense or present perfect tense, one or the other, don't switch between them. So what I mean by that is you're not going to say I, you're not going to say we, we're not going to see you. Uh, some appropriate pronouns for third person language, he, she, they, their, he, her, um, him, her. That's third person language. So what I mean is you should never say, I looked up and found, we looked up and found, we are experiencing that uh, it would be in third person. That helps it to be more formal. And the past tense or present perfect past tense means Jones found. Present perfect means Jones has found. Jones has found that using third person language helps maintain the formality of an APA formatted paper right? That would be present perfect. So again, that's the from APA style guidelines overview. And the other thing about formality that really throws a lot of people under the bus is the concept of direct quoting. And my takeaway from this is just don't do it. So if you want, you can go to this website. And again, this isn't, this is correct in text citation. This is an addition to make this PowerPoint easier to navigate. You can click over to this website on a very, very specific when you can direct quote in sciences writing and when you cannot. But if you can't tell the difference, then don't do it. And I know this is in direct opposition to a lot of things that you were taught in high school. So in high school, you read a paper, you selected a block of text from it, you put it in quotates, quotation marks, you cited it, and then you commented on it, and that's how you got to your 10-page word count for your term paper. And nobody punished you for that. And sometimes in the soft sciences, that's okay, but in the hard sciences, sciences it is not. It's not. It's plagiarism. I know that sounds weird, but it's plagiarism. You are expected to have mastery of the content that means that you can paraphrase everything that you're saying in your paper without direct quoting. Now, there are some really good points that this resource uses that, you know, technical language, you don't have to quote that. If that is, if the official term, multiple sclerosis, you've got the phrase multiple sclerosis, or let's say uh, the treatment for Guillain-Barre includes plasmapheresis, right? You don't have to put Guillain-Barre in quotes. You don't have to put plasmapheresis in quotes. If so, if they said the treatment for Guillain-Barre is plasmapheresis, that doesn't actually need a direct quote because those are technical terms related to that thing, right? So generally, you're paraphrasing to demonstrate your mastery of the content and you are going to um, utilize the correct phrases and not need to, to block quote those. If you take a big chunk of text out of somebody else's work and comment it and comment on it in the heavy sciences, that's plagiarism. You are taking somebody else's work. So it's really counterintuitive and I know it goes precisely against what a lot of you have learned, but again, I'm going to ask that you go to that paper and you take a look at whether or not this person used direct quotes. Now, there's a thing in APA 7 where we do quotation marks instead of um, italics for certain phrases. So this is actually appropriate to something that's an APA 7 format. This isn't that he's quoting another paper. It's that he's doing the quotation marks to indicate a certain type of piece of information as opposed to block quoting a resource. So there are quotation marks, but it's not a reference. So go ahead and take a look at the papers that you're reading to build up this project that you're doing, this research paper that you're doing, and you're emulating that style. 
and they will not have block quotes. I promise you, they did not block quote anything. They do not have a sentence. They do not have two sentences that are a quote from a paper that they are citing because it is not done in the heavy sciences. And I take that very seriously too, because again, it's plagiarism, so. Okay. Now, another thing related to formality that isn't on the previous slide is, in my courses in particular, this being anatomy and physiology, sometimes pathophysiology, and those things are all very interconnected. If I'm asking you to write, write about a disease state, a lot of people will choose to work with something they're familiar with, something that either they have been through or an immediate family member has been through. And I think that's a valid approach. I think it's totally fair to use your college courses to process and understand things from your personal life. In fact, it's something I encourage very much. The downside of that is that sometimes people slip into informality. So let's say there was a research paper on a medical condition for a pathophysiology class, and I'm asking you to get into the nitty gritty of that disorder. A lot of students will say, my aunt experienced this, my mom experienced that, I experienced this. That's first person language and that's informal, first of all. Second of all, how do you cite that? So there are ways to cite in person information, and I've directly linked to that there. It's from the Purdue Writing Lab. Again, there's my in-text citation. There's no date for that. That having been said, it's, it's a very difficult line, right? My number one recommendation is if you are doing something that, because you're personally familiar with it, that you say, okay, well, my, to yourself, while you're in the process of writing, well, my mom experienced this. Where in the literature does it say that somebody with this medical condition will experience that? Can I find a resource that says MS causes paresthesia? You can, in all likelihood, unless your family member was an edge case, like one of those one in a million people who has an atypical presentation, which is possible. Um, but in all likelihood, for whatever progression your family member had, whatever symptom your family member had, whatever lab values your family member had, there's going to be something in the literature that backs that up. And so I would say find that paper that backs it up and use that as your reference. That's my number one recommendation. If your parent is that one in a million case, nobody else has ever had this disorder, there aren't any citations for it, there is a way to use in-person interactions. It would formally be an interview. If that person is still living, then you can interview them and say, what was your symptom on this date? And then at this link right here, you can find out how to properly cite that. But again, I just, there should be a formal way of doing it. Okay, um, a couple of other random points just to wrap this up. APA 7 added some font options, which is really good news for people like me who are responsible for grading these things. It used to be, I think Times New Roman was the font that you were supposed to use, but the default in Microsoft Word has always been Calibri. And there are actually several font options that are accepted now, which is a good thing. It's actually more accessible. Uh, so just for example, uh, a lot of sans serif fonts, such as Times New Roman, are easier, or not Times New Roman, uh, Comic Sans, for example, are easier for people with dyslexia to read. So this was an accessibility choice on the part of the APA, and I think it's the right choice. My favorite part is that Calibri is now one of the options. That is the default on Microsoft Word. You don't have to change anything. You don't need to know how to change anything. And that's life altering because some people just don't know how to change the settings. and I know faculty members who would literally just hand back papers and say it's it's not in the right font, it's not in the right font, fix it, fix it, fix it, before I can give you a grade on it. And I think that's a little weird. I'm glad they changed this standard so that just, just leave it default. You don't have to do anything anymore. Leave it at the default, it's fine. Don't go messing around with font sizes or margin sizes. Those are all determined by APA 2. Uh, font size 10 or 12 only and 10 or 12 within the approved font choices. Don't go over to Papyrus. Don't do it. I'm watching you. 
Headings are a part of AP and how you organize your paper, but there are several options for how to employ them. Again, if you go to that poster, if you go to the APA website, you can see what those options are. I did model it on my um, abstract. So abstract, you can see, is centered because that's a very major. So if you were doing the same kind of paper that we're reading here, and it has an abstract and an introduction and let's see, uh, you know, a method materials and methods and a discussion section. There is it, it would be formatted about like this. So just to be aware of that. Uh, but again, there's different sort of classes of header. And again, if you're doing one of my projects and I've got you writing in a table, then you don't have to worry about that formatting at all because I took that choice away from you. I took the choice to fail away from you. What else did I want to say about this? If you need more help, then your number one resource is actually going to be a librarian. This is academic rigor is what they do. I'm, I'm saying that, you know, academics might, probably aren't going around knowing everything about APA. I'm willing to bet that there are some librarians who do know everything about APA and could format that at the drop of a hat for you. They know what's up and they're there to help. They love helping. I, I know a lot of people have a really hard time getting help, but that's what librarians are really, really good at. And I've had the coolest conversations about APA with librarians. I know that's a really nerdy thing to say, but they're great. Writing centers are also great help for this topic. And your professor, if it's your professor's job or they're willing to help, I'm usually willing to sit down with a student who's specifically asks for help on APA. Uh, you know, how do you format this? How can I do this? And, um, Again, it's not specifically my job to teach you writing. Uh, I, it is my job to make you academically rigorous. And so you could argue that APA part is part of that. But in an anatomy and physiology class, we do not have time to stop and sit and talk about APA with every single student. So just be sensitive to what your professor is going through, uh, what how busy they are, and ask the librarian in the writing center first, and then maybe do those cleanup topics with your professor. Like, okay, but did you want headers a certain way? Did you want a title page a certain way? Did you uh, care about my formality if I included a family member in the topic of my paper? So that would be a good balance, I think. And look, I have a properly formatted references section, so you can check out any link that I utilized during the making of this presentation, and you can use this as a comparison for your references section to see if you did it correctly. All right, I hope this helps. I hope to never do this again. Thank you for your time and attention.